So I got I got started in this because a lady was referred to me who's having a t an antique table restored, and she needed a couple of stretchers to go between the legs. And so she brought her table over to my house, and I took a look at it, and I said, yeah, I can make them for you, but your legs have flutes on them. Do you need them on the stretchers too? She said, of course. I want them to match. So I scratched my head a little bit, and I told her I thought I could probably do that. So I started doing a, a bit of an internet search. Wasn't having a lot of luck. I sent an email out to the club, and sure enough, John sent me an email that says, I've got a jig, you're welcome to bar, come and get it. So that's what I did. And as it turned out, I used that to do my project, but I was so impressed with this little jig, uh, so simple, and like most things simple, it works really well. So I decided to make one myself. And then I made the mistake of telling Joe that I had done that, and that's why I'm standing here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so be careful what you tell Joe. Okay, well, we'll just do a little bit of history. <laughs> uh, the first uh, example that's been found of fluting was in an Egyptian necropolis. And it dated back to 17th, 27th century BC. So we're talking about 5,000 years that people have been using this. And, and what fluting is, in case you might not know, it's just a series of grooves in parallel, usually done decoratively around a column or spindle of some sort. And you may have heard of reading. So reading is similar to beading, <coughs> except that reading is done with beads and fluting is done with grooves. Usually a semicircular groove but other shapes are possible. So not a wood, we're not doing wood turning, but this is more of an enhancement yeah. like some of the other things you've seen us do here. Uh, just let's take a look and see what some of the things you can do. To the first picture. So there's a baluster. Uh, you might see that on a stair railing or uh, some other kind of railing. Pretty typical example. Next one. Uh, those are a set of table legs. And the grain kind of really hides it, but you can see them. The fluting is done down there. And the next one, uh, another spindle of some sort, maybe a stretcher. And to do one more. That's kind of a close-up. And one thing I'd point out is all the modern ones are done with cutting tools, so you'll see a, a circular shape there at the end of them. And the traditional way that this was done uh, was with a gouge, a hand gouge, and if you'll bring the next one up. So you can see this tapered effect on the end is how you can tell that those were made with a gouge. And you can also see that they're not particularly very uniform, so, but that's kind of way hand type things are done. Nothing wrong with that, but if you, if you have an opportunity to replace an antique, you might want to learn a technique for doing that, and I'm going to show you at the end of the demo how you can do that. The next one is a spiral. And the next one is, these are finials. And in this case, the flutes don't follow the profile. They were just cut straight through. So, but a nice decorative effect. Next is a lamp base. And here's something we might be interested in, is a nice bowl that's been fluted. And the next one, next couple are also fluted bowls. The next one, John, is my little project here where I made the finials for the antique table. And the next picture is a close-up. And you can see where I've come in with the gouge and I've tapered the ends because uh, I wanted it to match the antique piece that I was trying to recreate. So that's just some ideas of, of what you can do. And what sort of wood did you use? Uh, that was poplar. The, the lady who does the restoring is, lives right down the road from you, Mary Ann, Terry Gaddy. And uh, they can match anything. They're real pros at it. So 
she told me she didn't care what I made them out of. That she could make them look right, and I'm sure she did. So, fluting on the lathe, we need two things. We need an indexing capability, and we need some sort of a jig to hold our work, hold our cutter, and guide it along to make the flutes. So, first thing I want to talk about is indexing. So, some lathes have indexing built in. My Powermatic has actually two uh, stops on it, 90, 180 degrees apart, so it's not very useful. This one back here has an indexing wheel built into it, so it can do a broad range of uh, different fluting patterns. If you know how to use that, let me know later, because I can't make it work. I can't figure out <laughs> well, how to use it. John said it was a little difficult on his too. But you, you, you've got that uh, lathe? Yeah. I don't use it either, because it's too confusing. I bought an index wheel. So, yes, by, by far, the most common thing is to use what's called an index wheel. And so what this is, is a wheel with a s sets of precision holes. This one's got four rows, 60, 48, 36, and 14, I believe, is the smallest one. And this fits on your spindle, which we'll load it up in a minute. Uh, can you bring that chart up? All right, so in the body of this chart, these are the number of flutes. These are the rings, the 60, 48, 36, and 14 ring. So tonight we're going to do 16 flutes. It says our spacing is every three holes. So what I like to do is go ahead and mark them out with just a marker. That way... Uh, if you put one of these things on and try to count the holes, you're going to get messed up. You're going to get lost. So go ahead and mark your holes. And then you can very easy, easily visually see that they're all nice and evenly spaced. So that's one recommended. Uh, uh, and one other thing, you don't have to have evenly spaced flutes. You can do a pair, two, skip one, another pair, two, skip one. So a lot of, a lot of versatility for these things. So this pops on pretty snug, but it's not tight enough to stay in place. So what you want to do is clamp it down. Now I'm going to use my chuck to mount it with tonight because the piece I turned, I turned on a chuck. But if you are turning between centers, you can just take your one of your face plates and your center will still fit in there. So you can do it that way too. Good snug. The next thing we need is something to index to each hole. So this is just a simple piece of wood and a metal, aluminum piece bolted to it, and a piece of metal. You can put a piece of wood here if you like. Uh, clamp it to your waist. Turn it down. And I usually even add a, a starting point, but there it is, number one, just so I can tell when I get back around to it. So that holds it nice and snugly in place, and so to index, we just pop this out and pop it into the next one. So that takes care of our index. So the next piece of this is the cutting tools and the cutter. So. Most of your, uh, John, you want to bring up? Most of the time, people use a core box bit, <clears throat> which is just a simple radius bit. There's also a bit called a round nose bit that you can use. A little more exotic is a pointed round over, and the next two pic pictures show the profile that makes. <clears throat> the next one is probably probably what you would want to use. And then the next one is a barley twist bit. So that would make another pretty unique profile. All right. So those are the cutting tools we're talking about. So for a jig, uh, I did a lot of looking around on the internet to find a, some kind of commercial jig. The only one I found, beside the one that John Longley 
was one made by PSI. I think there's a picture of that one too. When I first started out on this, I was looking for something I could make at home. And I kind of had this thing in mind. So this is a base that sits on your lathe beds. And these two guides here that go perpendicular to the beds are used to set this rail here. And that's the guide rail for your router. And you can also set it angled so that you can get your taper on your wood piece. Only problem here, it won't follow a profile. You basically got to do a straight taper to make something like this work. So I thought that was a disadvantage. So, I want to quickly show you the commercial one, how it works. But I'm going to do the demo on the homemade one because that's probably what you'll do if you want to do this, you'll go home and make your own. Now, uh, this is called a Flute Master, and they make this metal bracket, and they make a, a tool holder for several different types of tools that they support. This one's for a rigid palm router. They make one for the uh, uh, TS Trend, TS4 Trend. Uh, if you have a flexible shaft uh, cutter like a Fordham, one of those, you can make a small tool holder for that. They support that too. So this just pops in here like so. Mount your cutter and your router. That pops in. Now I'm very impressed with these little tool holders because they're printed in 3D. And lately I've been looking at some 3D printed parts and I get more and more impressed the more I see these things because they're really capable of doing some very nice precision stuff. They're not cheap practice uh, plastic that you can drop in, on the floor and it falls apart. It's some fairly good engineering plastics used nowadays. So. This holds your router. The nice thing about this one is that we can now use this guide right here to follow whatever profile we want. So no worry about in-feed guides and, and, and fixed linear movements. The other nice thing is your depth of cut, instead of being set on a stop in and out, is just you just dial it in with this thing here. And talk about precision, each one of these clicks are 2,000, so you can set your depth 2,000 at a time. After you left the house the other day, I got on the internet and tried to find that 3D printed file. You can't find it. Can't find it. I don't have it. So the one thing we have to set up here is we've got to set the height of our cutter. And you just bring it up to your tailstock center, put the center of your tool at the center of your center, <coughs> Lock that, set your depth, and I would suggest starting out a little shallow on your first groove because you can always dial it in a little deeper. Can't add material back, right? So that's how that works. Like I said, I was very impressed with the simplicity of this. So I decided that even after I finished my job using this, that I had to make one myself. So. And I like making jutes about as much as I like making parts. So. <laughs> um, so I set out to make one myself. The only real disadvantage to this, uh, one more advantage, there's also uh, in the box that came with this, another attachment that you put on this base with this, and it'll do spiral flutes. And it's one of the few things I've seen out there that you can actually do a spiral flute with. So it has a mechanism that lets this rotate with, with this moving and you can put a spiral for it in. The only disadvantage to this, uh, and I'm not sure of its availability at all right now because when I went on their website, uh, I can get to the website, but when I click on any of the links to any of the products, I get a 404 page not found kind of thing. So I'm wondering if, they, if they're still in business. The guy or, who owned the business retired. Oh. 
So they're probably not. Well, you're lucky you got one of these when you did, John. So. It was like four years ago, five <laughs> years ago, six years ago. You got a collector's item. Yeah. The other I've thing. Of, I've got lots of collectors. Right? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> But it's, it, it, uh, the basic jig is $239, was the list price on the website, and then the jig to do spirals probably is at least added, not more so. Uh, the other thing, I could not find one of these plastic index things. The people who make this, I went to their website and there's even a scarier banner on that one about download this file first and it'll improve your browsing. So uh, uh, I did find uh, one that is with a company that John has recommended before, Chefware Chef Kits. Kits, and they make one out of steel, or is it aluminum? It's steel. Uh, very nice. It has five rows, I think, instead of six. So even more rows uh, gives you more options, but it's 79 bucks. So. I think those plastic ones were like 50 or 60 when they were available. But that's really yeah, the only expense I see that you have. They also they also make a, a metal bracket like this that's a little nicer, but this is completely adequate. So the only thing you need to go out and buy outside is the, is your index range. Or have a friend with a laser printer. <laughs> yeah, that would be handy. Um, so this is my take on it. So basically, I took a piece of when it's melamine, it's heavy, it's very flat, and it's very slick, so it moves nicely. And I just made a little angle plate, and also this plate that mounts to my standard router base, I put a couple of grooves in it and it adjusts up and down. So if you're just making one of these for your lathe and you're not going to ever run it on any other lathe, you can combine these two pieces and just make it a fixed height and that saves you a little time. But I figured I might be doing a demo on this one. So <laughs> I made it adjustable. So uh, this little piece uh, is kind of the main uh, key to it being the guide. I made this from a standard three quarter inch PVC cap. All right. So if you want to go do this and buy one, don't get it from Home Depot. They're flat on top. Lowe's has the round thumb shaped ones. So all I did is I chucked it on the ID. I turned the little letters off the top, kind of reformed it, cut the half inch hole in it and then turn this little segment here to fit my hole and parted it off so it fits in there nice and snug so it's replaceable if I screw it up so again this fits my standard DeWalt trim router And I don't have the nice dial-in adjustment that the printer part does, but my router comes built in with a depth adjustment, so no problem there. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure this is centered up. <coughs> and I guess I got lucky there. There's not a lot of precision uh, involved in this, neither in the jig or doesn't have to be extremely close on the setup there. The one disadvantage uh, to this is it's a little back heavy because of the router weight. And I thought some about putting some kind of steel thing up there, but I want to maintain the flexibility. So what I have here is a bag of lead beads that I used to use when I used to scuba dive. And that goes on there and that works just fine. All right. The other thing that I would recommend when you're doing this, when you put an index plate on, is unplug your lathe. Because uh, I, for one, am 
bad about touching the wrong switch. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about really tightening this because we're not. So one more thing. So you might be able to see that I've got a, a line here and a line here. So those are the extents of my flutes. And I've got a couple of 3 8 lines out here. That's where I would, if I'm using a gouge to put tapers in, I would go from that point. So I'm going to line up on where I want my flute to end. And I need to remember that I've got, this is a 3 16 diameter, so I need a little offset there. These are our stops. <coughs> and I want to try to put the cutter perpendicular to the curvature of the part. And when I turn the spindle, I purposely put a contour on it so we can see the benefit of being able to follow that. <coughs> It's almost exciting as watching somebody sand. <laughs> <laughs> so, there you are. Nice decorative grooving. So in case uh, you want to, uh, and I can see my stops, I didn't come to my stops evenly on this side, and that's because I'm getting a little sawdust in here. So if I were doing this at home, I'd probably go back and redo those a little bit. So I think the only thing I need to show you now is that if, if somebody asks you to do match up an antique piece and you want to come in here and try to recreate that, then set you a line back. I usually use about 3 eighths. You can use a handheld gouge like this. This is just a carbon gouge. This one happens to be a quarter inch. And this is one from my wife's power Carver. It's got a little steeper groove on it, so that's the one I've used in the past. And I don't know if you can see this or not from overhead. Yeah, a little bit. But you can just start out. Uh, I'm going to come away from my line a little bit since I didn't quite hit my target. I put uh, eight flutes in those two stretchers. So 32 on each piece times 2 is 64. So I did 64 of these by hand 
on that project. And by the time I got <coughs> done, I have to do a pretty good job of it pretty quick. Just start at a shallow taper and then take it in a little deeper so you match up the, match up the groove. This might work a little better. This area. So I'm not going to do all of them for you tonight. I don't think you will be here that long. After you do your fluting, I know it's dependent on the wood, but how much sand do you, would you have to clean up? Uh, this one looks pretty good. I might come in and just touch the edges up a little bit. I don't think the grooves really need sanding, but if you wanted to take a small dowel and wrap a piece of sandpaper on it, you could, you could hit it real quick. But it creates a pretty smooth finish down on the bottom that's going to take stain or or finish very well. So. How about the edges? <coughs> edges. The sharp edges. Yes, yeah. These these I would come in and just very lightly hit. But you want a good crisp edge there. I understand that, but you don't want it so sharp as it. You don't want it splintering. Yeah. You don't want to catch somebody's finger on it. But just a light touch with 220 grit soft sandpaper would be just right. So. Here you go. Any questions? Can you make me <laughs> I can. <laughs> By the way, this is the third time I've done this. <laughs> so it's not a project you need to be intimidated by. The jig is easy to, simple, easy to build, doesn't require a lot of accuracy. So I built mine in an afternoon one day. So. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Sure.